Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. This month, we are delving into all kinds of topics that have to do with women and Christianity in particular. And I think this is really important. Often, a lot of people that I hear from on you know Instagram and Twitter and on Facebook, a lot of times they're women. And one of the main questions I get is, how do I reclaim my voice? How do I reclaim my identity? How do I drop the shame of being a woman and feel completely empowered? How do I get free of this feeling that I'm somehow a second-class citizen? Now, I know not everyone listening to this podcast has had that experience, but there's a good number of you that do listen and do have this experience that I think it's really important for us to address this. And honestly, when I was in high-demand religion, I didn't think I was treated as a second-class citizen for a long time. Honestly, because I had been taught that the way I was treated was just the way things were. This was just God's order. This was just my place in the order of things. And, you know, people were pretty nice to me, and I had some power. I had some privilege. So I didn't really stop to question whether I was a fully equal citizen in the religion that I grew up in. And the more I learn about this, the more I realize how completely complicit I was in a patriarchal system, so much so that I thought it was completely fair, and I thought that I was being treated equitably. And even though I was being treated more equitably than maybe women in the past had been treated, I was still not being treated equally. And honestly, as I've been learning more about patriarchy as I've been learning more about what that system looks like and what it does to men and women. Patriarchy isn't just about the subjugation of women to men. It's about the subjugation of other men to men. And so it is about power over instead of power with. And I think one of the most important things that we can do for ourselves is to understand that this isn't how it's always been. Last week, we talked about the creation story in Christianity. And for many of us, we thought that that literally happened. We did not see it as mythology. We took the creation story very literally, at least I did. And I know several other people take it very literally. I've been scouring the internet. Most of the Christian websites talk about the first five books of the Bible, what is known as the Pentateuch, The Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those five books, those are considered written by Moses back in like 1200 to 1700 BC. We're taught that God himself spoke to Moses and said that this was how the world was formed. The world was formed by a solely male God. And he formed the first man and woman was created from the man to be his special helper. And woman listened to the embodiment of evil in the form of a serpent. She was more gullible than man. She was weaker than man. She was more sinful than man. And she eats the forbidden fruit from a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so God curses the snake for tempting the woman away from God. And he curses the woman for partaking of the fruit and for gaining knowledge, and then curses the man for listening to woman, listening to his wife. And then God makes man the ruler over woman. 
And we're taught that this is how the world is set up, that this is the natural order of things, that woman was never created equal, that she was created to help man. And then when she thinks independently, when she goes to gain knowledge for herself, when she eats of the fruit, that her punishment is to be forever ruled by men. And when you're raised in this kind of society where you're taught that this is the natural order of things, this punishment makes sense, that our subservience to men makes sense because of our inherent, maybe more evil, more weak, more emotional natures, we become easier to oppress. Now, today's podcast is to explore the fact that archaeological evidence shows that this wasn't true. Human beings have been around for over 200,000 years, and archaeological evidence shows us that not only was God likely considered female for the first 200,000 years of that human existence, but that ancient Israelites themselves probably worshipped a mother goddess named Asherah alongside El or Yahweh throughout the Bronze and Iron Ages. Now, in the Bible, we have lots of different names for God. El Shaddai is one of those names. El means God. When we hear Elohim, that means multiple gods. And we get that name for God a couple of times in the Bible. I grew up knowing that God's name was Elohim. I thought that was his name, the way my name is Terry. And yet Elohim is plural gods. Some have said it means God of gods. It could be a supreme God, but typically it's a plural God. So Elohim refers to several gods, which in a monotheistic religion does not make sense. And yet when we look at archaeological evidence and more evidence continues to show up, we're finding out that Yahweh, who is often considered to be the same as El, so El became Yahweh, we even have a Bible verse for this in Exodus, that he was often worshipped alongside a consort, a wife, or a queen named Asherah. And Asherah is mentioned like 40 times in the Bible, either as her name or some of her other names, because just like God, she has several other names, or she is mentioned by the objects that were used to worship her. Much like we talk about crosses in conjunction with Jesus, Asherah was often talked about in conjunction with a tree. So we get lots of different references to Asherah throughout the Bible, talking about groves, talking about trees, talking about poles. They would fashion these objects that you know, were crafted to look like trees. And so they'd have a pole and it would be fashioned to look like a tree, or they would take a living tree and cut off the branches and carve an image of Asherah into the living tree. So we have evidence both in the Bible, but also archaeologically that Asherah was worshipped alongside El or Yahweh. However, after the destruction of Solomon's temple and the Babylonian exile of the Israelites, when historians believe that the Old Testament was largely written from oral histories that have been passed down for thousands of years prior, we start to begin to see a shift in the worship practices of Israelites from the polytheistic practice of worshiping a male god, Yahweh, and his wife or consort, Asherah. Equally, we see that changing into the male-dominated monotheistic religion that became modern-day Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Now, I know there are some of you, based on some of the comments I got this past week, I know there are some of you that are like, why does this even matter? Can we just keep talking about psychology? And I'm actually talking about the history because it sets us up to psychologically free ourselves from the subconscious rhetoric we have about our worth as women and our place in the world. So is this important to talk about you know, deities, and if we worshiped a female deity, yeah, it is. Because if there's only ever been a male deity, if there has only been androcentricity, if that's the way spirituality is set up, then being a woman means something very different 
than if there used to be the worship of male and female gods, if there used to be priests and priestesses that were of equal value, and if there was this equal reverence for both the male and female gods, and then that was changed. If there was a start to patriarchy that was contrived by mankind, then there is also a way to end it because it's not the natural order of things. And that gives us a great amount of empowerment and freedom to be able to move forward and to discard some of the patriarchal ideas that do not serve us anymore. In the words of Mary Daly, who was an American philosopher, theologian, and an ethicist at the Jesuit-run Boston College, and she described herself as a radical lesbian feminist, she said, if God is male, then male is God. And, you know, even as I'm saying that, I can almost hear my evangelical aunt speaking to me in my ear right now saying, but God is without gender. If God isn't male, then males definitely aren't gods. But we consistently use he, him pronouns to refer to the Abrahamic God. And as a society, we actively resist the feminine pronouns of she, her, or the gender inclusive pronouns, they, them. I actually did an experiment this past week. Every time I got messages from people that were Christian, I would refer to God as they, them, or she, her. And the outrage, the outrage for choosing to use pronouns that were not masculine was incredible. In fact, I highly recommend using they, them pronouns for God, especially in the Christian theology where we believe that God is without gender, that they trans send, I guess, any sort of human form that they're without parts or passions, it really just makes sense to me that we would say they, because it encompasses all genders. It encompasses all expressions of humanity. But I got so much pushback from that this past week, and it was like super exciting to me. It's really fun I find to kind of push back against some of those norms and watch people's reactions. I don't like to be rude or mean, and I'm always respectful, and I love pushing against those ideas and just seeing how people react. Start some great conversations. Now, here are what some contemporary scholars and theologians are saying about he, him pronouns and the maleness of God. Just so you don't think I'm completely off my rocker here. I know I grew up in Mormonism where we literally believed that God was an exalted man, that God had come to earth, had lived a mortal life, maybe not this earth, but had come to an earth-like place, had lived a mortal life, had become a perfected being after being resurrected himself and like went to a celestial kingdom, had multiple wives and was glorified by having tons of spirit babies and being able to create his own worlds. And as I've dug more into Mormon history, I used to think that Mormon literature was empowering because prophets that had started our church said that men and women like together as co-creators would create worlds. But I've since found several quotes that said just the men would be creating the worlds. And when we go into the temple, um, it's just a team of men that are creating this earth. So when they're showing the creation, it is God, the father, it's Jesus Christ. And it is the spirit embodiment. It's Michael who we're taught becomes Adam. So Michael's spirit is embodied in flesh and becomes Adam. I told you guys, we have some really weird theology, but it is a team of guys. Eve like shows up and she's silent for almost the entire video, except whenever she's taking the fruit. So really the only time she talks is when she's taking the fruit. And in some of the first temple videos, like she didn't even make facial expressions. She just kind of like subserviently and docilely like followed Adam around. And (laughs) that always bothered me. The newer temple videos before they quit doing videos, um, she would at least show facial expressions and you could tell how she felt about things by her facial expressions, but she still didn't speak. I mean, oh, the misogyny in the temple. When I look back again, I don't know how I didn't pick up on the inequality. I, I mean, I did and I didn't. I did in that I understood that 
men had opportunities that I didn't have. And there were, you know, especially as a young woman where I would bring up like, could we go hiking? Could we go camping? Could we make Pinewood Derby cars? And I would be told that those were not like things that nice young ladies wanted to do. Or I would point out that the guys got to go on these cool trips, but girls baked cakes and was just told that there wasn't funding in our budget. And when I became a leader for the young women, seeing the discrepancy in the budget for the young men versus the young women, we had to get through an entire year of activities on like $1,200. And the men would have, the young men would have like 10 times that amount to work with, sometimes for a group that was smaller than the group of young women. And so, I mean, I was aware of discrepancies. But I wasn't fully aware of the inequality between men and women, was not fully aware. So God in Mormon theology is very obviously a man. Jesus is very obviously a man. And we talk about Heavenly Mother, but her name is so sacred that I say we talk about her. We like mention her in whispers almost. And there's a lot of secrecy and silence and a feeling of abandonment, if I'm being honest, amongst the women, particularly when it comes to Heavenly Mother, because she apparently gave birth to us, but she is not allowed to speak to us. We're not allowed to pray to her. We are not allowed to learn about her. Um, And there's just this sense of secrecy, mystery, shame around Heavenly Mother and a deep sense of like motherly abandonment. There are a lot of mother wounds in the Mormon religion because we believe there is a mother goddess, but we're not allowed to speak about her and we're not allowed to communicate with her. And it feels like the wound is huge. We'll talk about that at some point. I may do a an episode solely for ex-Mormons and anyone who's curious about the mother wound when it comes to mother God. But here are some contemporary Christian sources um, on gotquestions.com, which is actually a place where you can type your Bible questions and they'll answer you. They said those who dogmatically call God her or she are really referring to a different deity. Those who insist on using gender neutral or Female terms for God are effectively speaking of a completely different being from the biblical God. So they make it very clear that if you're using she, her pronouns or they, them pronouns, you are not speaking about the biblical God because the only way to speak about biblical God is with he, him pronouns. Um, And injusticemag.com says, I think we need to avoid using she in reference to God because ultimately it is seen as disrespectful. And that's from Emma Copper in 2020. And I think the big question that comes up for me is if using she is disrespectful, what does that say about the gender that uses she, her? If he, him is a respectful way to approach deity and she, her is disrespectful, what does that say about the feminine? What does that say about those pronouns? Christianity.org says, as we dig through the Bible, we find God referring to himself as male. The Bible also teaches that God created us male and female made in his own image. The reason why we refer to God as male is because this is the way God has chosen to reveal himself to us. He consistently describes himself in the masculine pronoun. Now, (laughs) a couple things come up here for me with this, and that is, If God chooses to refer to himself as male with pronouns like he and him and titles like father and Lord and, you know, God, what does that say about deity? And I also want to bring up that these are the same people that don't like to respect other people's preferred pronouns. So we respect God's preferred pronouns by saying he, him but we're not going to respect humans' preferred pronouns when they ask to be called she, her as a transgender woman or he, him as a transgender man or they, them as gender non-binary individuals. Find that really interesting that we're talking about preferred pronouns, but on this same website, there is discussion about why we don't honor humans' preferred pronouns. 
Just want to throw that out there. And even C.S. Lewis from That Hideous Strength says, but the masculine, none of us can escape. What is above and beyond all things is so masculine that we are all feminine in relation to it. Now, I want you to really think about how he uses the words masculine and feminine. These words are used in a way that is comparative, in which masculine is seen as strong and feminine is seen as weak, or masculine is seen as better and feminine is seen as less. So there's a lot of subconscious beliefs here, which is what I excel at unearthing. Whenever I'm doing coaching, helping people become aware of their subconscious beliefs is one of the things I'm best at. I love language. Language gives us so much insight into what we actually believe under the surface. We reveal ourselves to ourselves all the time. Right here, I'm sure C.S. Lewis thought that he was honoring God, but at the same time, he was dishonoring the feminine in the words that he chose to use and the way he chose to compare them. So he may not have been aware of it, but he thought that masculine was better than feminine. And that would give us all kinds of questions to ask about that. So I ask again, is it important for us to have this discussion? Yes, I believe it is. Because many of us were taught that the creation began with an all-powerful male god, or at least a genderless god that for some reason preferred male pronouns and titles like father, king, and priest, who ruled and created alone, without the companionship and equal standing of a female goddess. And history is beginning to show that that is likely not true, and that changes the whole narrative for everyone, both men and women. Now, before we go any further, if you are finding value in what I'm sharing here, I hear from so many of you every single week saying, this is changing my life. This is helping me understand myself. For the first time in a long time, I feel compassion and kindness towards myself, or I feel like there is hope. If you are one of these people, please help me amplify this message. Please help me be able to set aside that time to research every week. Help me be able to continue this podcast. Help me be able to amplify it so that we together can change the world. We can make the world a much more hopeful and healed place. Please go to emancipateyourmind.org and make a $10 donation or please sign up to be one of our monthly donors, whatever amount you can afford. Please go over and do that right now while you're thinking about it. It means the world to me, and it means the world to those that are coming after you and healing as well. All right, who was Asherah? If you're like me, you've never heard this name before. Before I started studying the Divine Feminine, did we ever worship the Divine Feminine? And I want to say a lot of the information I'm pulling today, I got some of those roots of it from a podcast called Breaking Down Patriarchy with Amy McPhee Alabest. She wrote Dear Mormon Man, What Would You Do?, which was an article that I think was life-changing for a lot of ex-Mormons. She has gotten a master's degree in um, studying women's studies. And has a podcast where she goes through some of the like biggest, most influential books on women's studies and women's equality. And it's just mind-blowing. I love her podcast, Breaking Down Patriarchy. So if you want to know more about some of these things, she goes into books like The Chalice and the Blade by Rianne Eisler, as well as The Creation of Patriarchy by Gerda Lerner. So much good stuff. I'm, I'm kind of addictively listening to it. But there are several of her ideas here in this podcast. I had never heard of Asherah, though, until I want to say October of 2020 was the first time I heard the name of Asherah and Ishtar, which are two of the prominent female goddesses in Mesopotamia during the Bronze and Iron Age. In fact, the first record we have of any god anywhere was Ishtar. Ishtar was considered the goddess of love and the goddess of war in many different Mesopotamian societies. 
And um, she was recognized and likely worshipped in Israel as well. Asherah was sometimes conflated with Ishtar. Sometimes those names got mixed up because another name for Ishtar was Ashtart. And that looks a lot like Asherah. So sometimes they would get conflated, but they were two separate goddesses. Asherah was a West Semitic mother or creator goddess who is the wife or consort of the supreme male creator god. Now, the name of that male supreme creator god was El in Canaanite culture and Yahweh amongst the Israelites. And Yahweh was often seen as a new name for the Canaanite El, which is even hinted at in the Bible in Exodus 6.3. So in this scripture, God is talking to Moses and he says, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Now, God Almighty in Hebrew is El Shaddai. El, God, Shaddai, Almighty. So he says, my name was God. That's how Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew me, was El. And by my name, Jehovah, which in Hebrew is Yahweh, was I not known to them. So he's saying, hey, my old name used to be El, and my new name is Yahweh. So we've got kind of this combination of El, who was married to Asherah. That is well documented. El and Asherah were considered a creator pair. El was the god of gods, another name for Yahweh. And Asherah was the goddess or the mother of gods, which I think is so cool. I always think of Daenerys from Game of Thrones whenever I hear that. Not mother of dragons, but mother of gods. So she was the mother goddess that created all other gods throughout the, the pantheon of Semitic gods. And yes, Israel worshipped in a polytheistic way before the capture of Babylon. This is also well documented. There are several different like figurines and like cultic items is what they call that. I have a really hard time with the name cultic items because as I've learned more about cults, I think all religions can fit into that spectrum. So I find that often we use the label cult for things that we want to discredit and we use the word religion for things that we want to give credit to. And we see this throughout Christianity but I find that this is particularly true when it comes to establishing the supremacy of Yahweh, which happens after the Babylonian captivity, that we start calling all feminine worship cults. And we start calling all worship of any other gods in any other society cults. And we do that today. I've heard people refer to other religions as cults and Christianity as the only true religion. I've heard that consistently growing up. And it's especially true because I grew up in a religious organization that I would say half my family considered a cult. So I know what that feels like to have people discredit things. And my own religion was really good at discrediting other religions too. So it was not one-sided. They almost alluded to other religions having part of the truth, but not all of it. So this happens in religion all the time. When we want to set ourselves up as having the truth, we do that by discrediting or diminishing all religions around us. And that's exactly what happens here is Asherah, who was widely worshipped throughout Syria and Palestine, who had epithets like mother of gods, Holiness was another word for her. She who walks on the sea, goddess of the deep, goddess of wisdom, the tree of life, the queen of heaven, and simply goddess. These were all names for Asherah. These were all names that were used interchangeably for Asherah, just like we see different names for God in the scriptures that all are referring to the same being. Now, here's the cool thing. I know there are some of you that are really feeling 
this pushback against this idea that there were multiple gods and that one of them was a supreme goddess alongside the supreme god El or Yahweh. I get that. I want you to sit with the discomfort. Let it be there. That's okay. This is us learning material that maybe feels naughty. Maybe that's something you're feeling. Maybe you're feeling like, "Mm, this is a little naughty. It might feel dangerous. Often that's an indicator that there's some subconscious indoctrination there. Allow yourself to sit with that discomfort and get curious. It is okay. Now, we're going to talk about the archaeological evidence for Asherah and for her worship as an equally important God alongside Yahweh. Are you ready for this? So ruins of an ancient temple at Matzah, patterned just like the Temple of Solomon with an outer court, an inner court, and a holy of holies. And it's from about the same time period. It was found in 2012, just a few kilometers from Jerusalem. And it suggests that she was worshipped in the Holy of Holies alongside Yahweh. Ancient religions often used large stones known as Betelis or Beth El in their most sacred places that were thought to be imbued with life and would actually give earthly access to a deity. So there are these huge boulders, okay? I know many of you have heard the term Beth El, the house of God. There's actually a town in Israel called Bethel. So a Betelis or Bethel is like a sacred, sacred place. It is where God dwells when God is on earth. And so they would use these big boulders as the dwelling place or the place that God could inhabit to commune with man without, you know, shocking man too much or making us die. And so in a monotheistic religion, you would expect to find one Betelis and one incense altar in the holiest place. But this temple had two stones, one larger and one slightly smaller, often used to denote a female goddess, and two corresponding incense altars. This suggests that Yahweh was worshipped alongside a female goddess in the temple in the Holy of Holies, as co-partners, co-gods, and co-creators before the Babylonian captivity. We have further evidence from at least two archaeological finds that mention Yahweh and his Asherah together. One artifact that I'm going to absolutely butcher this name, but the Kuntelet Arut inscriptions, I will spell that in the show notes. So the Kuntalet Ajrut inscriptions found on the northeast part of the Sinai Peninsula from 8th or 9th century BCE that Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah. And it shows a depiction of Yahweh, like a drawing, if you will, of what Yahweh might look like, like what someone thinks Yahweh might look like. And then there is another god beside Yahweh that is thought to be Asherah because it's there with this inscription, Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah. And another is on a burial inscription from 8th century BCE that blesses the dead by Yahweh and his Asherah. And while it's unclear whether the hundreds upon hundreds of figurines of female goddesses or fertility goddesses found all over Palestine in buildings of worship, businesses, and homes are Asherah herself, it's clear the ancient Israelites worshipped the divine feminine and called upon that force for help. Now, one of the names for Asherah was the goddess of wisdom. And we're going to be talking about more of this next week. But one of the names for Asherah was the goddess of wisdom. And so one of her main symbols was the tree of knowledge. Tell me if this is ringing any bells because this is what we're talking about next week. So I want you to be like thinking about this throughout this upcoming week. I want you to think about the symbolism, how it shows up in stories you're already familiar with, and whether those symbols are associated with good things or whether they are associated with sin and cults and being evil or wicked. So 
because one of her names was the goddess of wisdom, one of her main symbols was the tree of knowledge and just trees in general. So the tree of life was one of her names, but the goddess of wisdom, so the tree of knowledge was another one of her symbols. So a tree of life and a tree of knowledge. Because of this, the common person would have sought to commune with her in forests or groves of trees. Let me know if you've ever heard the term groves in the Bible. I specifically remember learning about groves both in seminary before high school classes as well as at college. She's often depicted holding serpents. (laughs) Have we ever heard of a serpent in the Bible? And the serpent depicts fertility or healing. So snakes were often symbols of fertility and healing in the ancient world because they shed their skin and they were reborn repeatedly and they heal themselves. She's also depicted beside or riding on lions, a symbol of power and might. She's often depicted as a pillar. So whenever there's figurines of Asherah, she's often depicted as a pillar with either a stylized or sculpted head. And she's holding up her breasts with her hands as if she's about ready to feed an infant. This evokes the feelings of a mother feeding or nourishing her children, the earth, and all of its creations. Many people turn to Asherah for empathy, for compassion, uh, for wisdom, for healing, like the things that we would turn to a healthy mother for. When you got your knees scraped, if you had a healthy mother that would respond to you, often many of us, we wanted our moms. When we got sick, we wanted our moms. When we were giving birth, we wanted our moms. Not because our dads weren't great people, but there's something very tender and compassionate and empathic about a mother's care. And we see some of this imagery when it comes to Asherah. So speaking of the Bible, I think it's important to note that historians now believe that at least three different people wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. And this is why we see such contradicting ideas, even in the first two chapters of Genesis. So during Babylonian captivity, exiled Israelites, they were writing down the oral histories of their people that had been passed down for thousands of years so they could retain their cultural identity while living in a foreign land. So if you don't know what happened during the Babylonian exile, Babylonians come in and over the course of like, I think it's like a decade, it might be 20 years. I'm not entirely certain on that. You can easily check that out on Google. But over the course of like a decade or more, There are uprisings that are happening in Jerusalem. They don't immediately kick out the Israelites, but there are uprisings and they start to send people away. They start to exile the Israelites to other parts of Babylon. And they do this to assimilate the Israelites into Babylonian culture and to sort of strip them of some of their power so that they can't continue to rebel. So they send them to the far parts of the Babylonian empire And these people would have had to learn, you know, new culture. They would have had to eat new food. They would have had to learn a new language. And so they're going to these different places. And just like when a family immigrates to another country, there's this desire to retain a sense of cultural identity. Growing up in a half Mexican household, I saw this up close and personal. So my home would have been one of those that assimilated really easily. My father married an American woman. So my Mexican dad married my very Americanized mother and we spoke English. We ate like a mix of Mexican and American food. Like I, my mom cooks really amazing Mexican food because my Mexican grandma taught her how to do that. But we also ate a lot of the like German and Irish food that my mom grew up with. And so, and a lot of hamburgers and like typically American food as well, hot dogs and stuff like that. So I grew up like eating like an American for the most part, speaking English, um, reading in English and just having a very American experience. But my dad's brothers, they married Mexican women And they spoke Spanish in their households. They only Mexican food in their households for the most part. And my cousins on that side of the family, though they speak English just as well as I do because they were raised bilingual, 
they have a very different cultural feel. And that was actually looked at as good on my dad's side of the family. So when we would go to Mexico, it was very noticeable that there was some disappointment with my dad that he had not taught us to speak Spanish, that he had not taught us our culture. And my guess is that this happened for the Israelites that were forcibly exiled to different parts of Babylon. They wanted to retain their religious traditions because, you know, that gave them a sense of self, a sense of identity. It's what so much of us struggle with, right? When we leave high demand religion is who am I if I'm not Mormon or if I'm not, you know, from the Church of Christ or if I'm not Methodist or if I'm not, you know, Southern Baptist, who am I? What do I believe? Especially like if you leave Christianity altogether, who am I if I'm not Christian? And so you have these Israelites that are likely feeling something similar. They're in a strange land. They can't go to the Temple of Solomon like they've been used to doing. They can't practice their religious rites the way that they're used to doing. They're separated from people they know and love in a land where they're speaking a different language. And my guess is there's this longing for identity. And so they begin to write down what had been exchanged orally now starts to become written down. and. The people who could write are men. Women were typically taught to, you know, take care of household duties. Reading and writing were not necessarily important for women to learn in this society. And society had been moving towards more of a patriarchal order because women were busy at home taking care of kids and doing housework. Men were out in the public sphere. And when you're out in the public sphere, you also have the time and energy to and the ability to uh, get together with other men, to create laws, to, you know, learn from one another. Um, And so it was men that were writing the society. It was men that were writing down the histories. It was men that had the time and ability and the resources to do that. And so that's what's happening in Babylon, is you have men who can read and write, writing down the oral histories that women probably knew just as well as men but men had the ability to write them down. And so we have just men's voices, just male writers writing the books in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, and honestly, so many books since then. So what's happening is we have all these different perspectives because it's several different people. So we've got several different biases. So at least three different biases in, um, in the books of the Old Testament, especially those first five books. This is important to understand that the Old Testament wasn't written down and compiled until the 5th century BCE. So that's like, I think 586 is when the Temple of Solomon was destroyed and the last of the people um, were exiled. So people were all exiled. Um, A few were left to like tend the land and, you know, take care of the agricultural resources that were there in Israel, but the vast majority of the people were parsed out throughout Babylon. And those first five books show linguistic evidence of being written by at least three authors. So this is something I love. This is something I used in Mormon history is they've started to run texts through um, algorithms that can tell you the similarities between someone's writing style. So whether I'm writing nonfiction or fiction, you're going to be able to tell that it's Terry writing with a certain percentage of certainty. And we have three distinct writing styles in those first five books of the Old Testament, which which suggests not one author, but three. And there's also linguistic indicators as well as ideological indicators that can date when texts happen. So there are ideas in these first five books that place it sometime after the Code of Hammurabi and after some of the other more important events because some of those ideas that had not shown up previously are in these texts, which suggests that they're not older than these texts, they're younger than these texts. So, so exciting. I love what we can do with technology today. This means that these books didn't come straight from God's mouth to Moses' ears and then chiseled into rock, like I was taught. 
I was taught that that's how the Ten Commandments happened, but that's how all the scriptures happened. God speaks to Moses. Moses immediately writes it down. Whatever may or may not have come from God's mouth into Moses's ears went through six to 700 years of oral telling and retelling. So this is basically like a several centuries long game of telephone before it was ever written down. I want you to think about how much the stories in your family have morphed and changed in your own lifetime. What, you know, your uncle Sergio did with that crazy taco truck, like what started off as probably just a simple thing has become this like legend, right? That's been embellished or, you know, uncle John's loss of the business or grandpa working the farm, all these different stories they become embellished. They become almost tall tales. They change and they morph in order to make the telling more fun and more memorable. Now, imagine what would happen to your family stories if they had the ability to be told for another 600 years before they were ever written down. How much might they change? How much might society influence those changes before they were ever written down, right? What if farming suddenly became something that was looked down on? Would that change the story? What if tacos were the devil's food? Would that change the story? What if your Uncle John's business revolved around something that was considered really embarrassing 600 years from now? Would that change the story? Society is going to change what we emphasize and what we de-emphasize in the telling of the story. So by the time of the Babylonian captivity in 586 BCE, patriarchy had been spreading across Europe and parts of Asia, including the Near and Middle East. We see evidence of the ancient Babylonian king Hammurabi's code of law in attitudes and practices described in the biblical text. In Hammurabi's code, women were considered property of her husband, and they were to remain loyal to his house. There were all kinds of punishments for women who were believed to be unfaithful, from elaborate tests to prove her innocence, to being thrown in a river and drowned if she wasn't holding up her wifely duties. And over in Athens around the same time, women are considered legal minors of their husbands. They're considered children that are owned or guarded by their husband or other male family members. They could not represent themselves in a court of law. They had to be represented by a man, either their husband or another male relative. This made women vulnerable in that they were reliant on male family members, and there were no laws in place that would protect a woman from her male guardian. These are the kinds of ideas that were permeating the culture in which Yahweh became regarded as the supreme creator of the heavens and earth and the one true God. These are the ideas. This is the societal atmosphere where Israel moves from a polytheistic, multiple gender worship of gods to one true male god. With this in mind, reading the myth of the Garden Eden again and throughout the Bible, it reads like the words of a narcissistic man trying to nurse his emotional wounds after a nasty divorce. Which actually makes a lot of sense to me in light of the Babylonian captivity, the loss of cultural identity, and the desire to hope for deliverance. I mean, think about it. These people were just ripped from their homes. They probably felt pretty powerless. They probably felt lost and afraid. The idea of an all-powerful God that would deliver them probably felt pretty enticing. The desire for a sense of nationalism, especially once they came back together 70 years later, they decide to become much more cohesive and probably much less open to cultures around them. They wanted a central identity and they divorced themselves from all other gods. Yahweh was the God that defined them as Israelites. Yahweh was their God. All other gods they shared with other cultures, they got rid of those gods. They divorced themselves from those gods so that they could really root into nationalism. And we see this repeatedly throughout history when a nation is humiliated, when a nation is conquered, they often come back, they swing back with a much more entrenched nationalism that is much more authoritarian 
we reach for control. We reach for certainty as a way to help mend our wounded egos. And I think that's what you're seeing here. But in that process, we get some of these abusive, almost narcissistic ideas that are woven throughout the scripture as they're trying to depose any and all other religious beings. And that includes the divine feminine. It becomes cult-like to worship the divine feminine. It becomes evil, sinful, wrong to worship the divine feminine. That doesn't stop Israelites. They continue to do that, but they are called out throughout the entire Bible, particularly women, for continuing to have objects that remind them of the divine feminine in their homes, which continues throughout the the time course of the Bible. Now, we're going to delve into this notion more next week. We're going to really dig into the divorce of Yahweh from Asherah. I just wanted to introduce the divine feminine and the, the evidence that she existed, that she was worshipped side by side with Yahweh. I will put all the sources in the show notes so that you can click on them. There's YouTube videos. There are um, academic journal articles. There are uh, articles from theologians. There are articles from historians. There's so much information. Feel free to delve into that. Next week, we are going to dig in more to the actual divorce of Yahweh from these symbols, the tree, the tree of knowledge, the serpents, the goddess worship, and a lot of those attributes that were given to Asherah they are appropriated and made his own. So several of the things like the tree of life, like walking on water, um, become something that symbolizes God. And even the creation, um, the idea of being the mother hen that gathers the chicks, so many mother goddess type references to God the Father, who is trying to embody both a a father and a mother figure, but in a way that's very jealous where you can't acknowledge the mother goddess or any other of the gods worship during the time. Now, I'd like you to take some time this week to really think about what would change for you if you saw the male god El slash Yahweh slash Jehovah as the ancient Israelites likely did, as a co-creator of heaven, earth, and the humans that live here with the equal contributions of a divine feminine goddess. What would change for you personally if you saw Yahweh or Jehovah as a co-creator with the divine feminine? What changes in society, if anything? These are just discussions. I'd love to hear what you have to think. Gerda Lerner said, the system of patriarchy is a historic construct. It has a beginning. It will have an end. The creation story makes it seem like male rule is the way our earth was created. But 200,000 years of archaeological evidence suggest otherwise. How does knowing that patriarchy hasn't been the order of life since the world was created change your view of the system we now live in? Knowing it wasn't just how it always was. Does that change anything for you? These are the things we're going to be talking about on the Emancipate Yourself Facebook group. Go over there, join the discussions. We'll be asking several questions throughout the week. I want to hear from you. I don't know it all. I could probably study this stuff. There are people who have made careers out of studying this stuff and they don't know it all. There's no way I know it all. I want to hear what you think about this. Did it make sense to you? Did it not make sense to you? Did it like give you a sense of peace? Did it make you uncomfortable? Does this feel like blasphemy to you? You're allowed to say that. We're allowed to talk about this. I want an ongoing discussion, just like we talked about last week. We have these things that provide the riverbed for us, but that doesn't mean that this is absolute truth. Let's have a conversation. Let's see as we continue to discuss, as we get all of our perspectives and we have conversations about it, does it change the course of the riverbed over time? Do we begin to look at these artifacts in different ways? 
Because remember, prehistorical evidence is pre-written evidence. We we have to interpret things. So what we talked about today is evidence, but could we be interpreting it through the wrong lens? Absolutely. Could we be interpreting it in a way that is influenced by modern society? Absolutely. So I want to hear from you. What do you think this means? How does it influence your life? Does it help you more easily reframe your relationship with God, your relationship with your gender, your relationship with people of other genders? What does this do for you? I want to know. Um, Even if it feels opposite to like my own bias that I know comes through in my podcast, I can't help it. I have bias. I'm really honest about it. You can disagree with my bias. I welcome it and I want to hear from you. And then last, how does knowing it was made up by humans, not God, empower you no matter what your gender? If patriarchy isn't God's order, if it's something made up by humans, does that empower you? Even if you're a man, even if you're a woman, if you're transgender, if you're gender non-binary, How does that impact you? I want to hear all the answers. I can't wait to hear what you'll have to say this week in the Facebook group. And I will talk to you next Sunday.